What's happening? How's it going? I hope everybody can hear me. Can't hear myself very well. I got some new headphones. Turn this down just a little bit. Uh, welcome to episode six. I hope everybody is doing okay. Uh, rough times right now. Uh, I have to be honest, uh, this week uh, I've been going through a pretty crazy and terrible tragedy. And uh, so this show is going to be a little bit different than the previous shows. Uh, even though we just started, uh, I want to try to keep some consistency in doing these streams. So I'm not able to do much uh, improv, uh, improv uh, like live music, um, or improvised live music. Um, but I, I will I will be uh, just playing some beats that I have here that I've made that kind of improvised. Um, so I'll just kind of uh, first we're gonna be doing a hanging out with Ibrahim Mustafa again. We're gonna give that a try, and then uh, we'll be playing some just some live beats for the for the last hour. Um, and I won't be doing too much microphone stuff with the music, um, but I uh, hope everybody sticks around, enjoys it, and uh, yeah, it might be like this for a couple streams. But then we'll get back to the regular show. I had an idea for our interviews, or not interviews, but our conversations, <clears throat> to kind of keep them fresh. Every time we do it, we, you 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 could answer three questions. And the three questions are, what have you done previously? What are you doing now? And what do you want in the future? <laughs> so <laughs> the, they're, they're, they're sort of just uh, temp templates. Of like a some okay. basic. Is this like as it pertains to a certain pertaining to topic? your to your work and your art and stuff, okay. just to get it just to get an update on what you're working on. So so kind of like yeah. like what have you done previously? Like in the in the pre like the last few days since we haven't talked, and then what are you doing currently? Oh, okay. And then what in the future? What are you what are your hopes? Kind of thing. Yeah, um, since we last talked, so I've been um, I'm developing a new graphic novel. Um, and I'm in the sort of planning stages right now where I've written out uh, like a synopsis where basically it would be like me telling you the plot of it, right? So then yeah. this character does this and, you know, and I send that to my editor and publisher um, and then they will give me notes based on, you know, oh, I think we should, you know, make this part stronger or like emphasize this character's, you know, arc more here or whatever. Yeah. Um, so I'm waiting on those. I should have that by next week. In the meantime, just to get ahead of it, I've started writing the script and the parts that I know aren't really going to change, most likely. You know, some of it's just character development stuff or whatever. Mm -hmm. And, like, personal moments. Um, and then I've also been doing some concept art because this story takes place, you know, it's kind of one of those, like, five minutes into the future stories where, like, Minority Report or something, you know, where it's, like, the future but not crazy i see far into the future yeah um so i've been designing what the vehicles will look like in it mm. um which is basically just kind of like a newer version of you know i did a mustang and a lincoln continental mm -hmm. those are two of my favorite cars <laughs> so i kind of looked at like the old you know 60s models yeah and then applied like a modern aesthetic to them um so kind of like then, like concept cars a little bit yeah yeah and i i was looking at other concept cars for reference and you know when i say modern aesthetic i, I don't mean necessarily like today because then it would just be like whatever the 2020 mustang looks like but like sure. kind of i i looked at okay where where is vehicle design trending and technology trending and like what kind of things might we see in 30 years right yeah um now, obviously, there are people who are, like, paid to do that and much better at it. And they've studied engineering and stuff. So, you know, what I've done might be a little more fantastical. But it's essentially just kind of a sleeker sort of, you know, uh, post-Apple, post-Macintosh, like, world of design. You know, how, like, everything kind of gets smoother and, I see. you know, there's, like, a touchscreen stuff and dark you know tinted glass over elements and things like that so yeah um so that's what i was doing 
currently I am uh, I have, there's a character in it who has cerebral palsy so I'm trying to I'm looking at um, motorized wheelchairs that that uh, folks with CP have now and trying to apply that same aesthetic to what a motorized chair would look like in 20 30 years with this oh, kind interesting of yeah well have you um, have you thought about um the technology that they have like have you seen uh those robotics that they're creating for like legs um they use them for like soldiers to carry heavy packs and stuff but i've seen them use them for yeah people. they're like an exoskeleton kind yeah. of thing yeah i've seen them use those kind of for, yeah. for people too um to, to yeah walk. i don't know i i need to do some research on it because i think like that would apply more to somebody who was like maybe paraplegic sure whereas i, I you know i i'm not an expert so you know bear with me but from my understanding of cerebral palsy, it affects like muscle in different ways. So I think you would have to have full range of, I don't know, you might need to be able to use those muscles to utilize something like that more so. I see. But yeah, I may- could be, yeah. you know. Maybe. I don't know. It, it, yeah. Well, it depends on the degree of the cerebral palsy. And, you know, right. I, I, um, I was actually born uh, three months early and the doctors thought I was going to have cerebral palsy. Um, oh really? Yeah, and they they uh, actually told my parents that I would never run or jump as high as any other kid, and um, that wow. I would have troubles. Uh, I would have uh, trouble developing my coordination on my left side when I was young. Um. So, so yeah, and I did. I think I did, or at least I was told told that I was going to have that. So it was in my mind. <laughs> um, yeah. But so yeah, so I always sort of. Uh, you know, and when I ask my parents about it, they they tell me that they thought that I was going to have problems um, like that, and or you know, be affected by that, and <coughs> so I always kind of have a connection to that a little bit. You know, um, that's interesting, man. I I didn't know you were. You said three months premature. Yeah, three months. I weighed uh, I weighed uh, two pounds. Wow, that's yeah. that's wild too, because like. A lot of times that stuns people's growth, but like you're a tall guy, you're like six three, right? Yeah, I, yeah, I can't. I want to say that I've read s- some stuff saying that actually, tech like for some reason most pe- premature babies are tall, but I don't, hmm. I don't know, I, I don't know how it is, but yeah, it was pretty wild, man. I mean, I, it's a story that I was told for a long time, um, but seeing photos, you know, of just being like a s- really, s- just being a teeny small little baby, somebody's holding, it's. Pretty wild. Yeah. Did that did that affect you growing up? Like, were you? Uh, do you, do you think you kind of put limitations on yourself in any way because of this expectation oh, you were given? Oh yeah. I mean, I had, it affected my self esteem for sure, and um, it was kind of a story that I always had in my head. So it was, you know, doing sports and different things it was difficult. Um, because I don't. You know, it didn't it didn't affect me in, in in a very visible way, and so people just thought I, you know, it, I couldn't say like, oh, this is what's going on with me, I guess, or it wasn't very clear. Mm. Um, but yeah, it wasn't until actually I got a drum set and I started playing drums and um, was was had I was really good at it and I got a lot of more self confidence and like, oh, I can, you know, I'm more coordinated and I can do stuff and. Um, I, maybe I don't have a problem. So, so yeah, it was, it was well, definitely something that you were able to, yeah. Yeah. Um, something I struggled with, but, uh, but yeah, it's, it's not something that, it's part of my story, I guess it is. I can't minimize it. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Damn, I have weird shaped ears or something. These things don't. <laughs> I've, I've heard that actually. Some people. Um, it don't fit some people's ears, but yeah, so that's cool. So you have this, you have this character, yeah. and so you're looking up uh, different styles of uh, wheelchairs and things, and looking at where they're going to progress. Um. Yeah, and so that's kind of what's on my plate at this moment, and then moving forward, there's I still have a bunch of other concept stuff to design. Um, you know, just sort of like 
future tech stuff that's not too wild, like no flying cars or you know anything like that. But yeah, um, I basically have to come up with visuals for like a situation room. It's a the story is kind of about like a government agency um, that deals with time travel, like in the future. So mm-hmm. um, I'm trying to figure out like what will their equipment look like and. You know, it's one of those rooms that's like, oh, Jesus Christ, that's Jason Bourne, you know. <laughs> I see. So uh, so you're talking about like a situation room. So it's like kind of where they train or. It's like a where they monitor what's going on, like with their agents in the field and like, you know, um, uh, sort of like, you know, if if their people are on a mission, like what what does that look like? How oh. are they monitoring it from I like home base kind of thing? Yeah. Yeah. Kind of so, like, I mean, not, not really, but kind of like NASA watching. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Okay. Absolutely. Okay. And so the idea is like, they have kind of a holographic, like 3d representation of like time, you yeah. know, and they can see like where in time their people are. That's you know? awesome. So thanks man. Yeah. It's fun trying to figure it out. And you know, um, it's it's really hard to come up from with that kind of stuff from whole cloth like i'm not yeah it's not one of my stronger areas so i'm trying to get better at it so hopefully this will be an excuse to do that well it's definitely um i think we talked about this i don't know if on a stream but it's definitely a uh, it's an interesting thing to to do because it's the time travel and that kind of technology is like is like um there's a weird fine line where you don't want to be too magical you have to be yeah. you have to be kind of accurate and scientific um but like you know there's a there's a, there's a there's a a magical portion of it that needs to be invented that's like exciting you know right when you have to give it limitations otherwise you can you might as well just make them be able to teleport because these that's are just right. going anywhere doing yeah. yeah, yeah. So there have to be some rules to it, and it can't be a MacGuffin where it's just like, oh, well, because of time travel. You yeah. Know? Um, so I spent a lot of time doing that when I was developing the story, and then I see. you know it's kind of a house of cards that you build for yourself. You know, so it's like if yeah. you get too, you know, caught up in one aspect and you forgot about this other part of it, then you know, if you tug on that thread, the whole thing kind of unravels. So it's really you got to be careful. Yeah, I would imagine. I mean, I I, I want I want to say I've read multiple articles about um uh the Avengers movies and just, you know, different struggles they've had with all these different timelines and oh, I can't imagine. You know. I mean, <laughs> yeah. juggling all that. Yeah. Seriously. Uh speaking of time travel and comic book stuff, it makes me think of that show uh was it ABC or what? Whatever, maybe not. What you know, with like the um the the Green Arrow. Uh, I can't think of. Oh, what it's CW. Yeah. Yeah, but it's the group, uh, those group of people, and they. Oh, uh, Legends of Tomorrow. That's right. Yeah, Legends of Tomorrow. Yeah, that's a fun show. I I only watched the first season of it, and I enjoyed it. You know, it's like it's a little low budge. Sure, little, all of those schlocky, but like all of yeah. those are, but, but they're, they're like fun. acceptable. Exactly. Yeah. Man, I, 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 the last episode of the first season made me cry. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you watched it, but I, that shit got me, bro. I was like, damn. I don't remember what and what happened specifically. Well, yeah, I guess we can talk about it, right? It's, it's yeah. like several years old at this point. So yeah. the guy who plays uh, Leonard Snart, Captain Cold, he's like a Flash villain. Oh, yeah. Uh, and then there's, I don't remember the other guy's name. He's the fire guy, right? So they're kind of like the hot and cold dudes yeah they played brothers on uh um what was that show prison break which i was heavily into i think i think Mm. we were neighbors when i was watching prison break that's right yeah um because i got it on dvd and i was like i can't stop it's so good (laughs) um and so you know they were on this show in a sort of like brotherly capacity as well and uh, one of them ended up sacrificing himself to save everybody. And he was kind of like the villain, you know, or like he was a villain turned into like a sort I'm, of anti-hero. I remember that. And by the yeah. end, 
yeah, he ended up like going out like a G to save everybody. Yeah. And that shit just hit me. Moved you. (laughs) (laughs) That show was actually, I think it was really good for the like, it's, it's, you know, later on it's gotten pretty cheesy. They're trying to come up with ideas, I think, but yeah. uh, It was, it was good. It was, it was really good. I did a, I did a performance at Nike once with the woman who plays White Canary on that show. What? What do you mean? Yeah, she so so Nike would hire dancers for like internal fashion shows where basically they were their designers were presenting like you know the spring activewear line I to see. their you know inner management or something. Yeah. And so so me and Mighty and like the homie Levi did one. I don't know if Mighty did it, but me and Levi did for sure. I think Mighty was there. Um, and, uh, you know, basically it's like a runway show, but then you have to like break dance and, you know, do whatever kind of dance you do. So yeah. we were being hired with models, which was very weird because, like, <laughs> you know, it's like you're either really good at dancing or you're really good looking and you're not necessarily going to be both. <laughs> that was kind of the, the spread we had. But she, the, the woman who, uh, was like coordinating the event uh like brought a couple of her own people with her from la for this little thing and yeah. one of them was katie lots who's the the um actress who plays uh what's her name uh white canary and she's a b-girl man she's got head spins and stuff like she huh. she was nice i can't remember she her was a little rude name. though to be honest really yeah, like it's, wait, maybe, so she, maybe. she's like the main character gal on that show, right? Yeah, and this oh. was obviously way before that. I mean, we're talking this is like at least ten years ago. Wow, um, I, I didn't realize she's a yeah, B girl. That's think, crazy. Yeah, um, she she uh, she was they, there was a guy who came up as well who was like they were both kind of like the you know the main ladies like people that that she brought right. And, you know, I mean, you and I were both part of that scene. It's a very communal, like, everybody loves to get down together and just, like, you know, the whole thing. I mean, really, that's hip-hop in general. It's, like, yeah, you know, uh, it's about, like, ciphering together and stuff like that. And, yeah. And so, you know, that was in the heyday, too, back when we were doing all that stuff all the time. So I, I invited the two of them out. I was, like, hey, you know, while you guys are in town, like, a bunch of us go get down at this thing. Like, you yeah. know, I think I invited them to Bigfoot or something. So you were trying to Mac and on white Canary at the time. Not at all. Oh, I mean, okay. a, I had a girlfriend B. I mean, you know, she's a very attractive woman. I didn't think she was like really in my league. <laughs> I see. I see. <laughs> and C, like I, as far as I knew, the guy that was there was her boyfriend or something. You know? Oh yeah. Um, yeah. I was just genuinely like, they were dope. Like, especially sure. she, I don't, I think he was all right, but she was really good. And I was like, Man, that'd be dope to have like you know, a a, a really dope B girl come out to the Goodfoot and you know check out the scene while she's here. And stuff. Yeah, well, and it was, it was always were, it was always cool to meet people from out of town that like were MCs or, or dancers yeah. or whatever and bring them to the spot and it's like oh this is our this is our scene. Absolutely, man. And then sometimes you would then get to go. You know, and they're like, "Oh, hit me up when you're in my city, and I'll take you out." And you know, yeah. that's how you build the community. Yeah. And stuff. So, um, and I wasn't, I wasn't being a weirdo or anything. I was like, "Hey, you know, if you guys want to," I think I wrote my number down and like, you know, I was like, "Hey, if you guys want to come out tonight, like, you know, a bunch of us go get down. It'd be be cool to have you." Yeah. And she was just like, I remember she was like putting her hair up, and she goes, "Thanks," and I was just like, <laughs> "All right, fuck you." Wow. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. It's it's interesting to, you know, I've only I've met like a handful of famous like r- pretty really famous people and it's it's just interesting to see them in person and see their personality and their you know their stature and the way they are in real life. Yeah. You know, in comparison to and to especially with with actors or, or, or yeah, with actors because they're you know, they they they're able to they like uh, when they're on TV or when they're doing whatever. They have this personality that they portray and this energy, and it's and it's uh, it's not real, you know. It's like I remember yeah. finding m- myself um, doing like seeing a play or or doing an improv thing and thinking like, 
man, that person seems like so cool, you know, like I, I, that person just seems like the coolest person. And then, and then meeting them off stage and it's sort of like, they're just a completely different, they're like a real person. It's not the character. And it's yeah. like, oh, oh that's kind of disappointing. <laughs> Real quick. We got someone in the, in the stream chat here. They said, no way it's French Montana. I know. <laughs> I said, never mind. That's not French Montana. And I, I, I was like, I don't know what this dude looks like. And I looked him up and that's, that's pretty good. I do <laughs> look like this fool. A little bit. Yeah. I think he's Arab. He, he's Arab, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Is. Yeah, I see him here with the the Calabella on and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, this um, this stream and and this is actually Ibrahim Mustafa. He's a comic book artist. He's he's cooler than French Montana, in my opinion. Is he? Is French Montana? He's a rapper, right? Yeah, he's a rapper. He's like a main. He's like a mainstream. Like uh, he got signed by Bad by Diddy from Bad Boy. You know. He so. looks like the after of DJ Khaled. <laughs> yeah, they're kind of, yeah. He's uh, you know, he's he's uh, he's what he is what he is. He's successful, I guess. Is a way to is put he it. any good? He's not my cup of tea. I don't yeah. I can't say that I've heard like people say say like uh, you know, in the hip hop world like he's respected, but I think like as a rapper he's successful. Okay. But I don't know. Maybe his, he is. His, I'm not a, you know, I don't his, know much about him. His real name is Karim Kharbouch. Mm. He is Moroccan. Moroccan American. Interesting. Born and raised in Morocco. Yeah. All right. But at least he's Arab. That's cool. I mean, it's not like a. Yeah, it's kind of an accurate. Like, hey, you assessment. look like this Mexican dude. Which, I mean, that's fine too, but. <laughs> you know. Yeah. I mean. Um, if if you were French Montana, you sure need to invest in a better webcam. Yeah, I know, right? You know, that's what blows me away about these like different things happening with the quarantine. Is like, you know, Saturday Night Live or whatever. These guys are like using their cell phone. It's like all you got to do is buy a camera off of Amazon and a light, and it looks a lot better. Yeah, it's all choppy and shit. Yeah. Um, I am my wife got a new computer and she i'm gonna use her old one as like a as a secondary one in my work nice. bench so that i can like watch stuff you know because the one i'm on now is not situated to where i can use it while i'm working on like my figures and whatnot so yeah um that one has a built-in camera i want, I want to see how good that one is but i do need to to pick up one yeah um, well eventually doing this regularly I mean, you're not French Montana, so it's not that big of a deal. But I, I don't have that. I don't have that like yeah. Khloe Kardashian ex boyfriend money. You yeah. know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just learned that as when I looked him up. <laughs> <laughs> um. So so what? So you. So you are. Okay. So pre. So you're working on you're working on that now. Right. Yeah. That story. And yeah, so that'll be moving forward. That'll be the thing I do for the next, I mean, I think until like the end of March, pretty much. Okay. So yeah, next up is writing the script. And then once that is approved, then I'm off to the races actually drawing it, which is the most enjoyable part for me. So, so what, yeah. so how is it getting, uh, man, I would imagine it depends on the, the people that are giving you notes on your stuff. Mm -hmm. um but what so how is it getting notes and how, you know, how is your experience with that like just responding to the notes or yeah um i've i personally gotten much better at it yeah uh, it's it can be a very difficult thing when, when you spend a lot of time on a thing and somebody tells you to change it sure or you know alter it um I've never been super precious about my work in that way, thankfully, like, cause that, that can really hold you back. Cause some people will just argue tooth and nail over a note and it's like, it's not a big deal, you know? Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll certainly stand my ground on things that I feel passionately about, you know, if I have a good reason for it, but honestly, most of the time, the notes that I get are things that I either should have noticed or things that, you know, just make it better, frankly, like, especially, I mean, my publisher, uh, 
is uh, a guy named Mark Wade, who is one of the most accomplished comic book writers in the history of the medium. I mean, mm. he he's written stuff that, um, you know, has influenced the movies. Um, you know, you saw Man of Steel, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, to remember, you know, when he says, like, it's not an S, it's a symbol for hope. Like, that, this guy Mark Wade wrote that into a Superman book, and that's what they pulled that from for the movie. Wow. And there are, you know, a, a couple dozen examples like that. Um, and yeah. probably all of, you know, the adventure stuff too. Um, so if he's got a note, I'm taking it like straight up because yeah. it's always going to make it better. That's um, a, that's actually and, seems cool to get notes from him. Oh, it's incredible. I mean, I was about to say, like, frankly, it's like a privilege to, yeah. to you know, um, and every note of his that I, get and then utilize makes things just you know that much better so yeah um so yeah the kind of notes will generally be stuff like oh you know i don't think that this is paying off strong enough or like i think we need to set this up more so that this payoff uh you know hits harder later or you know um we should check back in with the bad guy we need another beat here where we see what they're up to or that kind of thing. Mm. Um, so then it's my job to go in and say, okay, how do I, you know, fit that into this, you know, puzzle that's already kind of been slapped together. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, it's a fun challenge, I think. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, I have to make it all fit into a certain number of pages. Um, so that's when I get to kind of go in and say, okay, what can I trim? You know, what if I, what did I get too long winded on? etc mm-hmm. and how do you so do you have a method to that or it's just kind of just kind of go through i just kind of yeah i just kind of go through it and and you know i'll have their notes open in one you know document or email or whatever and then um i'll i'll have the script or the story synopsis in front of me and then i'll find you know the spot that they said to alter then i'll go in there and you know make those changes based on you know a lot of times it's it's a suggestion um they're not saying add this this and this they're saying can we develop this more and then i have to figure out okay well how do i develop that more like what does that look like Mm -hmm. so it sounds like they're kind of just reflecting some things back to you like that they're yeah i mean from the story yeah sometimes they're just asking you a question and the act of answering that question ends up being how you address the note, you know, like Mm -hmm. they might say, you know, okay, if the character does this, then how do they do that? And I've either established it, but they didn't pick up on it, which means I need to make it more clear because there's a reason they didn't pick up on it. Yeah. Or I go, Oh shit, I didn't even think about that. And then I have to go on and figure out how to make it, you know, connect. Yeah. Interesting. So, so, uh, so I'm curious. Instead, I guess instead of talking about wh- what you want to see in the future, I I was thinking about like, uh, for uh, for people that are interested in doing art and drawing and different things, uh, or maybe you know doing exactly what you do and illustrating you know comics and writing stuff and working with companies. I guess you know when you were a kid. And you were, I, I would assume, interested in drawing. Mm-hmm. Um, how did you see that, like, as a possibility? You know, as like a career, and yeah, just like what kind of not like your whole life story, I guess, but just like uh, how did you sort of, as a kid, uh, interested in drawing and and and, and uh, move kind of move forward and say like, oh, this is this is a thing that I want to learn, and and where did you kind of find the inspiration for that and how did you do that yeah i mean from a very early age i just had this kind of urge to if i liked a thing i just felt like i had to draw it like i remember watching the x-men cartoon when i was like six or seven Mm -hmm. and seeing wolverine for the first time and just being like i have to put that on paper you know (laughs) i don't really know what it was about it and i always did that with you know superman batman and ninja turtles and stuff like that wow um yeah, it was just kind of like it was a sort of an urge to do something with this thing that was like intangibly in my head after I saw it on TV or something or in a comic. You know? I see. Um, 
and yeah i think you know for a lot of kids like most kids start out drawing you know because it's just like a very basic sort of motor skill thing that kids do and i think the difference between those who uh take it further and those who don't is that you just keep doing it you know Mm -hmm. stay interested in it Um, because every kid is about as good as every other kid up to a certain age and then you know if you stick with it then you get better and if not then that's where you plateau yeah um and then yeah I, i never really knew how it could be a career option honestly i mean for a long time i told myself well i'm going to be an art teacher because i had teachers that i liked and i liked art and i thought that's a way to do art and have a steady job mm. uh, well you know so that, that was that's something that i mean a lot of you know actors and and comedians and stuff is you know that's what they'll yeah. do in between jobs even yeah for so sure it's, i think it's definitely uh um, you know it's, it's a noble thing yeah to teach people yeah, I mean, to want to share that thing. And I've, you know, I've had some great uh, instructors, like, you know, at the community college level yeah. in, in like painting and stuff like that, that, you know, I I was inspired by in the sense of they were really good at articulating these sort of intangible qualities about art, like, you know, the way that paint, like watercolors pool, you know, when they're watered down a certain way or, you know, just being able to talk about the effect of the pigment in the water and how it mixes. And when you do this with your brush and stuff, I found to be like really interesting. And I was like, I would like to learn how to convey that information as well. (laughs) So um, I started on that path and that was my whole thing. I was going to be an art teacher. And um, I started to get kind of disillusioned by it when I found out how much education you actually had to have. Like typically you need a master's to teach, Yeah. you know, yeah. Um, at least at the kind of teaching I was thinking of doing. Now I could teach probably because they hire people all the time at like community college who don't have masters because they're like a professional in a field. Mm-hmm. You know. Um, I actually just but, saw uh, a, a art teacher job in uh, like Mount Hood Community College or something like that. Oh yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's something I, I you know, always kind of kept in the back of my mind. Mm-hmm. especially now is like a lot of schools are starting to teach comics stuff you know mm. um but i sort of have some certain kind of like philosophical issues with that because while it's a cool elective you don't go to school for comics graduate and then get a job drawing comics like it's not like a vocational thing yeah in that way you know i mean there are there are a couple of schools that have programs um, and there's one school specifically that is entirely for comic book art, and it was founded by this sort of uh, like legendary comic book artist, and his his family ran it for a long time, and they just sold it recently. But you know, their sole purpose is like you go there, you learn to draw comics, and then that really is the only truly kind of like school to professional work pipeline in the industry. Mm-hmm. Um, but other than that, it's just kind of about being tenacious and doing your own work and self-publishing or you know meeting a collaborator getting your book out there and then eventually you get hired yeah Um, well you know it makes uh, me think about uh in the in in the improv community when i was you know taking improv classes i did the so what happens is you know a lot of these how i got into improv is um i was you know watching some comedies i've always been a fan of comedy and i realized i'm like I remember thinking, uh, looking for Chris Farley's stand up. Like, oh, he didn't do stand up. I just assumed, like, all funny people did stand up. And then I right. realized, oh, he does improv. Like, what? Like, what is that? Like, I kind of, I know whose line is it, any, is it anyway, kind of, but what does that mean? And so then I realized there's this whole thing like that. And, like, you're talking about, you know, improv theaters teach classes, and it's kind of like a vocational sort of process where people go through the training and then they graduate and then they but the thing is is you know improvising isn't like a job um but people want to learn the skills and then take them and anyway my point is is that i did a i did a workshop with uh some some women and one of them was an actress on this nbc show uh, and so famous actors will or impro- improvisers or actors or comedians will host these workshops and charge you know um, I don't know, forty-five dollars for the class or whatever it is, 
and mm-hmm. people go and they just sort of do a workshop. And I'm just curious if like do Comic Con type situations ever do that where you could like advertise a workshop with Ibrahim Mustafa th- showing how to, you know, draw comics or do a specific aspect of it and then kind of charging per head and just sort of kind of like teaching a little class in a way. They do have similar stuff like that, but it's in their panel programming. So, mm. you know, they'll have like rooms within the convention center that it's taking place at or the hotel or whatever, mm-hmm. usually a convention center. And, you know, it'll be a stage with a table and a bunch of chairs and microphones and, you know, and then an audience of, of banquet seating. And, I see. Um, yeah. And, but those are included with uh, your admission to the convention. Usually you're paying you know, anywhere from 25 to $45 a day to be there. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of like a buffet in that way. <laughs> um, so I've done stuff like that, but they're usually only like 45 minutes to an hour. Yeah. So there's not a lot of room for, you know, a ton of information and it's usually you and a bunch of other people. I see. Um, so uh, yeah, in that respect, definitely. Um, but yeah, that's interesting. I don't know that there are really workshops like that i think the 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 barrier of entry is pretty low with with the comic book industry in terms of you know it's weird because it's a form of entertainment like you're in the entertainment industry to a degree but you're not famous so there's not yeah i mean there are people who are famous to comic book fans but they can go to target and nobody knows who they are sure (laughs) sure um and some of them forget that i just want to be like yo you're not famous chill out like, yeah you drew batman a couple times just calm down, <laughs> you know? um, well, well it seems like it just makes me think like uh you know improvisers can they basically what they do is just connect with a uh improv theater in a city you know like a lot of people from mm-hmm. los angeles will do that up here and host these these workshops and i just wonder like i don't know like say comic book shops in different cities you could like host a a workshop where you show up and kind of talk about techniques or you know whatever and but just it's just a way to kind of make money and a way to, for people to you know learn a little bit that's that's actually a really good idea and i can't believe it's not a thing already <laughs> i'm sitting here as you're yeah. talking about it trying to think of like what are the what would be the barriers to that and the only thing i can really think of is that you know, people will do signings at comic book shops and yeah. say, say when they have a book come out, you know, they might go hit like a bunch of different cities, like, you know, a little West coast tour type of thing. Sometimes they'll drive, sometimes they'll fly, whatever. Yeah. But usually it's on your own dime and usually you're not getting paid to be there. You know, sometimes a, a store will, will fly out like big name talent to do a signing at their store yeah, uh, yeah. because they know that they'll kind of make it back in sales, you know, with people coming to the door to buy the product and stuff like that i see um but yeah i you know and i mean there is a certain amount where i think it's assumed that you know because it's not a big barrier of entry like yeah i'll sign you know you don't have to pay me to talk kind of stuff yeah but i think what you're talking about is like a legitimate like professional work workshop scenario in which case i could totally see you know, you could probably even go like pitch it to comic stores and say like, Hey, you know, I'm going to be in town for X amount of money. You know, I could teach a class at your shop and then you could charge admission. Yeah. And then you keep what you make at the door and I get my fee kind of thing, you know? Yeah. Well, and the cool thing about that is you can book them ahead of time. So it's like, say you just want to make some money. If you have a manager or, or just yourself or whoever, you know, have them call around to different comic book shops within the nearest states and be like, yo, hey, we want to do this. I charge this much. And they just can book it ahead of time if they have the setup. And, yeah, you know, so I don't know. It's just an idea. I'm not trying to tell you what to do, but it's... A, it, no, it's, no, it's a really cool idea, though. Honestly, I've never considered it. So I'm going to have to put some thought on that and see. Because if you can get a couple of friends together who are industry professionals and kind of build it that way then yeah you know it's kind of you can combine like a signing with the workshop and then you know hopefully that's a way maybe for the shops to make some money as well which is yeah the big goal of the industry and the community so yeah. yeah i mean you could do you know like the way that they'll do with the improv is they'll do the workshops during the day and then like that night they'll have a performance 
So you could kind of right. do that same thing and just do like a signing at night or something. Or if you're doing a release, say you have something that released recently, you could do like a thing for that that night and but do a workshop during the day or something. I don't know because I just yeah. think like because you know my family are all artists and I I used to draw when I was a kid and I you know I'm not interested in necessarily becoming a professional artist but I would totally pay for a workshop just to like learn some techniques and see how you know people do that and yeah you know well that's one of the cool things too about the sort of democratization of all sort of entertainment mediums at this stage in our sort of evolution in technology and whatnot is like you know um print on demand stuff means that anyone can make a comic and then submit the files to a printer and then order 50 of them you know and sell them at a convention whatever. that's how i got started mm. um and then you know the fact that everyone's got a pretty decent quality camera in their pocket you know you can make sketches and and things like that or even i mean people have made entire films on iphones before you mm -hmm. know so yeah um yeah it's interesting how we're kind of at that point now yeah yeah it's cool i mean it, you know I, I there's just so many different uh there's an interesting thing that's happening i've noticed with the generation before us who are what generation x uh, you know mm -hmm. they they had a lot less people in their generation uh technically so like um so basically like i i i can speak from like listening to um comedians talk on podcasts and them talk about like how there wasn't a lot of competition when they were like coming up when they were young cuz there just wasn't a lot of comedians but like now with our generation there's way more people in that generation and so there's just a ton of comics it's just a completely different yeah. thing um, but, you know, so it's interesting to see the things that they've developed, you know, like for instance, the, um, the workshop thing or, you know, different ways of kind of making money in entertainment and, and, and then that sort of being combined with what's going on with the internet and technology. Yeah. And, you know, you bring up an interesting point because I, I think, Another thing about our generation is that we value entertainment more than generations before us. Maybe not as much, maybe not necessarily like exponentially more than, than like Gen X does, but you know, the reason that it's always like, oh, millennials are buying, you know, avocado toast or whatever is because <laughs> the, the only things that haven't uh, increased exponentially in terms of cost yeah are things like dining out and and you know movies and tv and stuff like that right yeah so while houses have you know quadrupled or more in cost right yeah i mean it used to be you could just graduate from high school get a job you know doing just about anything and you could you know support like a family and a mortgage for sure you know that's not the case anymore and and that's why our generation values the, those other aspects more because we can actually afford them you know I see. um yeah so yeah i think because of that it it creates more people who want to provide it as well and then it tends to like kind of flood those respective scenes maybe that makes sense that's interesting yeah it seems like there's just a lot there's just a lot more of it too you know with the more people being in our generation though it's just a lot yeah that's uh and you know we are kind of a i mean look at twitter you know the whole point of twitter for most people is to be funny right get those hot takes out and stuff like that so yeah everyone kind of fancies themselves a comedian anyway you know even if they're just taking sort of a joke formula yeah well like you know what that feeling when you blah 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 you know yeah yeah well, it's kind of like the one thing that tripped me out more recently is when I realized that memes were are technically a form of comedy. They're like their own form of comedy. Yeah. You know, like I, there's this girl that I went to high school with and she's a I, I saw her on Facebook or Instagram or something. And I didn't really know her, but uh, she like makes memes. Uh, she uses 
a ca- she sets up a camera and makes memes with her own image uh, so she can, you know, sell them or, y- you know, make money off them or whatever. So she'll, like, pose oh. and, you know, wow. put the meme, like, your boyfriend, you know, whatever the quirky little thing is or, you know, jokes yeah. and stuff. Um, and she has a whole thing of just, you know, thousands of memes. Uh, and she also does stand-up. But but it just tripped me out. I was like, oh, wow, I never realized, like. I didn't know that was it's, a thing. It's yeah. just its own, just memes in itself is just, like, its own form of comedy, you know. It's like, um. The the comedian fat uh, the guy or whatever fat Jew, I think that's what he goes by. I just learned about that guy recently. Yeah, I may have even yeah. told you about him. But you yeah, might he, have. Yeah, he um, that was his thing. Like he was just post, he just post like tons of memes and got really popular. He got trouble. He got trouble because he didn't oh, actually yeah, create he, like, stealing them or something. Well, he so what he did was he just he was just posting a bunch of memes on Instagram and you know obviously he'd put his little comment at the bottom of it like acting like it, he made it kind of you know just like a joke that went along with the meme um right. you know like whatever like my best friend's lazy and like man that asshole sucks you know uh anyhow he got really popular and um so he was just like thriving in this popularity and somehow he got he got a uh, point pointed out by people but I I want to say Pat Pot Patton Oswald was like the kind of like the main guy who was like this dude oh he got some deal i think he ended up getting uh some some sort of deal with a network for a show or a writing deal and it turns out that he he, he never really did anything he just you know i guess like he, he he wasn't really a writer he wasn't really a comedian he just like posted these memes that weren't even his so People were really reaming him, and Pat Oswald was like on top of it. So anyway, I don't know, just a weird. It's kind of like a. Do you ever look at TikTok? Yeah. So they'll take. Or I don't, but I I see TikTok videos a lot. Oh, I like see. On other, yeah. So what they'll do is, you know, they they can take sounds. So they, I don't know if you know how it works with they. So say we put out this video, and I say like chicken's really good, then someone could use that audio. And make their own video and like act it out. Chicken's really good, and then it gets really popular, and all of a sudden, like nobody knows what the original is. Yeah, they, you know. Yeah. And so they'll do that with like the Office jokes or uh, Reno nine one one stuff, and it it becomes its own thing, sort of like stealing. You know, jokes. It's, almost, it's like they're sampling jokes. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's yeah. kind of like the way hip hop sample, kind of, but it's uh, yeah. It's a very similar. I think. I mean, yeah. in my opinion, it w- with hip hop, uh, there was a, an amount of respect that you know the, the the people that were sampling originally sampling soul records and stuff grew up on that music and they had a respect for right. it. So it's a little bit different, but but it's it is very similar. Well, now you have to clear samples too, which is like you know you don't have to clear TikTok audio. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's interesting. I don't know. I don't know what the the rule is around that, but I'm sure I'm sure it's bound to happen something like that, you Yeah. Know? Uh so. speaking of sampling, wasn't the first song to like, oh, you have to clear that. Wasn't that Bismarck E? You, you got what I need? Oh, I don't remember, man. That or I just don't... a friend. What's the, I don't remember the name, the name of the song, but I think that was the first like kind of landmark case was it i, w- I want to say it was yeah. de la souls a de la souls album or something but i uh, i can't remember i w- i watched a netflix movie recently i was very excited for it because it was based on one of my favorite graphic novels it's called last days of american crime and the movie was very bad <laughs> the guy who played the villain in it was amazing every scene he was in was fantastic yeah but the everything around it was not good uh but uh he the villain comes out at one point and sings that song because his girl is two-timing him with the main character like she's kind of playing them against each other yeah and so he's singing that you know you you say he's just a friend part and stuff uh but they and this is what made me go like oh yeah i think that was the first landmark case or whatever because they apparently didn't clear singing that in the movie so he's mouthing the words and it starts off as that song, but then 
they like dub in him saying something else so <laughs> they don't get in trouble. So it was like his mouth was moving and it was a different it was it was like, pretty rough. You made me dessert <laughs> or something. Yeah, it was it was like it was kind of like adjacent to what the actual lyrics are, you oh, know. I see. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. they'll just throw in random words when they do that. Like yeah. Really bad dub. Or like the, when the in uh, the Big Lebowski, uh, what's his name? Uh, uh, fucking John Goodman has a line where he's like, "This is what happens when you fuck a stranger in the ass," right? Yeah. But on the TV version, it says, "This is what happens when you find a stranger in the Alps." Because like that's kind of what like matched the mouth, you know. Yeah. Well, that's the Cohen brothers, so they probably put some work into that, I imagine. Yeah. Those guys. Are, are... we cursing on here, by the way? I didn't. I think so. Yeah. I mean, within okay. reason, you know. <laughs> I mean, I I read through the rules, and you can you can you know, within reason as long as you're not like threatening or threatening to harm cool. somebody or like. Yeah, just... my bad. I was like, oh. No. Just, it's... Uh... Yeah, it's all yeah. good. No, we can cur- we can curse and you know be. It's not. I don't have it selected for children, so it's not gonna. Some little kid's not gonna, you know, roll in here like cartoons, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um. Uh. Man, I was gonna. What was I? I was trying to think of like superhero movies or shows that I had seen recently, and it just slipped my mind. Um, you watched The Boys? Did we talk about that? The boys, I think we not on the stream, but I think we may have talked that movie. That show is awesome, man. Yeah, season two, I think, is September 4th. I'm so excited for that. Yeah, there's not it's not a superhero thing, but there's a a comic book called The Old Guard, it's written by one of my favorite writers. Yeah, um, and it's uh, it's about these like immortal mercenaries. And that's going to be a Netflix movie that comes out in like two weeks. I think it's July 10th. Hmm. So very excited for that. It's written by a guy named Greg Rucka who lives in Portland. He actually also wrote the book Stumptown that is what that show is based on. Oh. Um, yeah. My One of my best friends does the the art for that. So that's cool. Uh, very stoked for him. Yeah. Have you, have you um, seen that, sh- that show? Uh, well, so there's two, there's, there's two shows on Netflix. They're from from the same writer. One of them is called I want to say it's like the end of the fucking world or something like that. Oh yeah, and, yeah. And, and it's about a. I haven't seen it, but I know the one. Yeah, and then there's another show, and I can't remember the name of it, but it's by the same guy, same style, uh, but it's it's about it's kind of like a superhero thing. It's about this girl that like yes, uh, deve- uh, kinda, what's it called something like. I can't both some it's uh, something in it with a similar like did that just happen or yeah like, yeah 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 <laughs> that show I don't know if you've seen that but that was I thought that was pretty cool I like this yeah thing. we we watched it it was good yeah. yeah it's the comic is based on is very like sort of rudimentary in in its art style yeah like, I did. it's almost I more it like up. a comic strip I was I was surprised to see that because the content of the show is you know. It's almost pretty heavy. It's almost like a movie the way that they do those. Yeah. 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 So to see that it came from this like, you know, kind of crudely drawn thing was interesting. Yeah. Um I've been revisiting a bunch of the Marvel movies lately just because they're fun and like you can just put them on and feel good sure watching it, you know? Sure. Um and man, I gotta say, it's it's really impressive the way they wove all that stuff together. Yeah, like the, the things that are sort of planted in every movie that you know. Um, I don't know if it was always intentional that they were gonna pick up on it, but obviously when they wrote the next one, they went back and they were making references to things that already happened. You know. Yeah. Um, yeah, really interesting to to revisit like Captain America's entire like you know start with. Captain America, the first Avenger, and then Avengers, and then, you know. Yeah, they did an excellent job. I I mean, they didn't really, I've only, I want to say I've only seen a couple things that they kind of messed up. Um, you know, they just did such a good job of connecting all those films, yeah. and, you know, and just making them interesting and engaging and keeping the story, you know, keeping, like, the amount of action and the story line interesting and 
the the emotional investment of characters and they they yeah i mean they just did a great job yeah creatively i would love to do something that is like a long form kind of saga or something that that really you you get those early setups and those later payoffs you know yeah yeah i have to say i was just thinking earlier if you ever get something that's like option for a film or a movie or uh, whatever i'm gonna have to travel to wherever they're they're doing auditions and just try to get in that damn thing yeah <laughs> you know we we we've been close with high crimes a couple of times a i thought bit. about that yeah i was gonna ask yeah. you about that yeah which is funny you live your neighbors with the guy i did the book with now <laughs> yeah i know i know that's yeah. wild man that's a wild yeah you you and i's this town is so small fr- friendship has been like that though you know it's just been yeah it's just weird weird like that yeah in a cool way you yeah know? um we got close on that and then i everything i've done since then has more or less been for other people um i i uh, i had a thing that i did it was about a guy hunting nazis after world war ii that i had representation for but Mm. he wasn't doing a very good job and i just kind of let it fizzle because i didn't think he was very interested in trying to sell it speaking of that Um, have you seen that show hunters on amazon I haven't watched it yet. I heard it wasn't good, but I, it looks like something I would enjoy regardless. It's so. pretty good. It's pretty good. You like it? Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't. It wasn't as good as I wanted it to be, but it wasn't bad. It wasn't. It was. Yeah. It was still really good. Yeah, I got to. I got to start that one. Yeah. I think. I think maybe at least for myself, I had. I had like, uh, you know, I don't know anything I watch with Al Pacino. I have like unrealistic e- expectations for. Yeah. So if it's not like the best thing I've ever seen in my life in that period of time, then I'm like, eh, I didn't live up to Al Pacino's thing, you know. But other than that, man, see that that show actually that and there's a movie um, called I think it's called Operation Finale with Oscar Isaac, and it was a similar thing about like hunting down a Nazi. I think maybe in South America, right? And this book that I did was about a guy who actually kind of looked like Oscar Isaac, like he would have been perfect casting for it. And it was like set in like, you know, 1949-ish. And it was about a a spy who, um, it was kind of, you know, James Bond vibe to it. It was about a, a, a spy who was working for the Allies. He was captured by Nazis and tortured in a prison camp. And then after the war ended and they were freed from the camp, a bunch of the Nazis just went off scot free, which is what happened in real life. You know, they escaped via rat lines to South America, and and a lot of them had themselves declared dead so that they couldn't be, you know, prosecuted because you can't prosecute a dead man. Yeah. Right? So they had falsified death certificates. So this character was hunting down the guys with falsified certificates, and he was sort of like unofficially sanctioned by the British government, right? Um, because you know uh they were like look we'll disavow any knowledge of you if you get caught but technically these guys you can't get in trouble for killing a dead man so go clean up you know the mess um (laughs) and so i i I gave it to and i was nominated for an eisner award for it which is like the oscars of comics you know so i had a little bit of buzz on it and and I, i gave it to this uh uh like talent rep guy who was recommended to me by a bunch of friends who use him for their comic stuff yeah in like hollywood or whatever and he was just like yeah you know period stuff's real hard to sell you know because it takes place in like the late 40s and i was just like yeah all right i mean it doesn't sound like he's that you know I mean, like anybody anybody that, that does that shit is, is, is right not worth and then i know. see this you know this hunter show and this operation finale movie and stuff like being advertised like a year later and i was just yeah. like Oh yeah, real real hard sell, I guess, right? Like, so, <laughs> he's probably yeah. kicking himself. I would imagine guys like that, agents and different things, kick themselves in the ass when they when they do that. Well, I'll tell you, he's also the reason that our book High Crimes didn't get option because it was about to. Because Chris, the guy who wrote it, your neighbor, yeah, uh, he has an agent as well, and his guy sold the book. 
more or less. Like it was like a done deal. Yeah. And then my guy, I caught, I, I emailed him to let him know, like, hey man, because he knew he was representing a book that both of us had representation in. And he never said anything like it was an issue, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and and it had been so long since we had any bites on it. I didn't think Chris, that Chris's guy was actively trying to move it. Um, and so uh, we had a production company that wanted it. And Chris's agent had it like just all but done. And then I, so I emailed up my guy and said, hey, man, look, you know, this happened. I was just informed of this. I just want to let you know ASAP. Like, I didn't want it to be, you know, like a weird thing where you find out some other way. Like, I just found out about this myself. Yeah. And he was like, oh, that's really messed up. Because he had one of another writer he represents, like, write a spec script for it. Right? Oh. So he was like, oh, well, you're leaving this guy out of the deal. And I was like, look, man, I'm not doing anything. I'm just telling you, like, you should be happy for us because the whole goal is to sell this thing, you know? Like, yeah it's not my fault you had somebody do something on spec to keep the wheels moving because then it looks like you're doing stuff for everybody you know yeah so then it got his script got rolled into the deal because we were trying to make it so that guy got paid too and then uh i guess the script wasn't very good i never read it honestly because i don't care like we made our book you know like i'm proud of that whatever anybody else wants to do with it just pay me it's fine (laughs) you know yeah um so yeah, they didn't like his script and then the whole deal kind of fell through. So that guy actively actually made it. So I didn't get something picked up. So now I'm like, I'm done with him. Yeah, that's, Long story I, short. I yeah. listen to Mark Maron's podcast and he talks, he always talks shit about agents just doing stuff like that. And yeah, I've always like, heard. What is that? You know, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <Mark Maron's. laughs> well, he always talks about like, you know, he spent like 20 years with this agent that just actively like tried to almost not get him work you know so it's it's good yeah. it's good that you made the decision to leave that guy alone <laughs> after the second or third issue I yeah think. yeah so hopefully you know now that i'm with because that one was was a much more of an independent venture that that nazi book now i have a publisher that is like they have their own you know uh they've had stuff made into movies before they have a, a vested interest in it financially so um nice. hopefully they'll make it happen and then i'll just get to sit back and let them do the work so <laughs> let's yeah. see yeah why well, not not to go off on something different but that the hunter show the cool thing about it to me is that it's like a bunch of jewish people that are coming together and hunting nazis so it's like a yeah it's like repaying it's like repaying the nazis that yeah, I love that. I love comeuppance, dude. I love revenge yeah. stories. Like, that's what my Nazi thing was, you know. And then this book I just did was like based on the Count of Monte Cristo, which is like the ultimate revenge story, you mm-hmm. know. Um, so yeah, I'll have to check that out. Um, I speaking of World War II stuff, did you see Jojo Rabbit? Yeah, I did actually. I saw that in a theater with my wife, I believe. Okay, we just yeah. rented it on Amazon last night. I'm a re- I'm a really big um, fan of um, the director of yeah, that. I can't, Taika Waititi. I yeah. yeah. Did you see Boy? Is that how you pronounce his name? Taika. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, oh yeah, I saw Boy and. Um, oh wait, Boy. So Boy is that movie that they did like took 14 years to do and. Is that right? No, that's that's I think Jim Jarmusch's Boyhood. Oh, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Wait. So what is yeah. Boy? Boy is just like about a, a little Maori kid in New Zealand and like his family, and, oh. and they call him Boy. And no, did he do that? He did his, that film. Oh yeah, you'll love it, dude. They're always talking. It takes place. I think it takes place in the eighties, and they're always talking about. I'm just like Michael Jackson, like yeah. in their little New Zealand accents, and like uh, the director wrote it also, and he plays the dad, and he's just kind of like um, that guy is in and out so of the talented. Kid's life. What's that? That guy is so talented. Yeah, he's amazing. That movie's really good. He he's had it. So he did that one. He did the Hunt for the Wilder People. Did you see that? Uh, no. I didn't see oh that. man, you gotta watch that movie. Hunt for the Wilder People. I saw. It's really so, good. So I. Oh, we got someone else here. Super. Dude, you got oh headphones. 
I have them on my list, yeah. Oh, that's my friend Jacob. He's he's produced some music for me. Nice. Um, <laughs> his face is he just <laughs> Yeah. He likes to put his his little his late his record label is called Face Records. So oh, okay. That's um, tight. Yeah, man. Uh, well, so uh, like, uh, you know, obviously I heard about him through the Thor movie, and his and yeah. his voicing of the character on there. And then I was watching uh, the show, uh, what we do in the shadow shadows. I think mm-hmm. is what it's called. Yeah. And I w- I could not believe how funny that show was. And I was like, oh my god. And so then I looked. Well, you know that's based on a movie. Yeah, did, yeah, yeah. Right? So then I did research okay. and I saw the movie and then I started researching that director. And then we saw Jojo Rabbit, and yeah, I, I got to see more of his stuff because he's yeah hilarious. Boy and Hunt for the Wilder People are great, and their Jojo Rabbit was really good, but it was also like heavier and pretty sad, you know. Yeah, his other stuff is is much more like it, you know it still gets sad and heavy in parts, but it's much more like uplifting. Yeah, uh, and like just kind of fun, you know. Well, jo- Jojo uh, Rabbit was a little bit. So the thing that I read about it is, you know, it's based on a story, a book, or something like that that was written by this guy. And and um, how do you pronounce his name again? T- t- Taika Waititi. Taika. So yeah. Taika uh, adapted the story, and what he wh- okay. the thing about it is the story is a very serious story. So he just sort of made up that that imaginary hitler character and injected mm-hmm. it into the story to add some humor so it it was a little bit weird to me because i felt like he didn't go full he should have went full one way or the other you know it's like he should have went full on like let's make this kind of a comedy or let's make this a more serious film with funny parts you know i don't know yeah i don't i mean because it was pretty funny and i don't know if you could because honestly, man, when we first in the first twenty minutes, I was like, I don't know if I feel like laughing at this movie. Like, yeah, and that's just based on the subject matter and stuff. That's kind of what made it weird for me. Is it was like I could yeah. tell that it was supposed to be like a serious, sad story. And it, it the the tone stuff juggling like that is is interesting too because like Thor Ragnarok, for example, like I love that movie. It's hilarious, but I don't want a comedy out of a thor movie Mm -hmm. you know like i want like you know almost game of thrones level like drama out of i see thor i mean not necessarily like that soap opera ish but kind of you know i want it to be more of like a you know the same thing you get out of like a movie about like king arthur or something right so you so you don't you don't like the direction they went with thor like with fat thor and all that stuff no well that yeah that, but i mean just like the third thor movie i thought was like too funny like i like the tone of the first and second ones better but you like, know, like they had jokes peppered in but you know that they're you know, you know that they're sort of you know they're they're banking on that now because they made him fat thor in the avengers and which you know that kind of i don't know how i felt about that either because like the guy experienced like the genocide of his people and like his entire family is dead yeah you know and to just like kind of make a joke that like he's fat and sad now it was kind of like all right you know <laughs> yeah it seems like but, they they they're really it seems like they did that because of the the strengths they saw that that actor has he's really good at like comedic stuff yeah 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 um, so but yeah i just you know having read thor comics that are like these epic runs of you know the character and the politics around it and stuff yeah i guess i just wanted more of that like the first movie was was much more the right kind of tone especially all the asgard stuff sure i agree Um, yeah the right tone for me the second one was really dark i felt yeah it was yeah it was uh it was definitely like more of a bummer for sure but again it's the kind of more of that like shakespearean like drama with this guy who can fly and you know has the hammer and all that stuff yeah um, yeah but uh no that 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 writer director is great though you will love boy and hunt for the Wilder people well, well you know he's doing the new star trek is that right star trek you got option to do that 
He's doing something Star, star related. Or star Wars, maybe. Star Wars thing. Yeah, Star or... Wars, maybe. Something one of those, Star Wars did, or Star Trek. Did you see The Mandalorian on Disney no, Plus? No, I I haven't watched any of the new Star Wars stuff. That's one thing I I always I like the classics, but it I never got into it into that too much. I'm I'm really not a Star Wars guy either, man. Yeah. I you know, because I do comics and stuff, it, it's like kind of assumed that I would be, but Sure. It just doesn't really do it for me. I didn't grow up with it, and I think that's it. Like, I don't have that nostalgia factor. So coming to it later, I was just like, is this what everybody's all yeah. into? Like, the, the sword fights are cool, you know? <laughs> yeah. It's it's like, a, well, you know, he's in uh, um, the writer, uh, George, uh, George Lucas. Mm-hmm. He was, you know, he's, he was inspired by Westerns. So it's sort of like if you liked if you know westerns are only a certain type of people like westerns. So right. I kind of feel like well, it's, it's, it's funny because it was like westerns and samurai stuff that he was inspired by, which are kind of westerns are inspired by samurai movies largely. Yeah. Anyway, I think it was kind of the lineage of those. I want to say like Seven Samurai, like like Magnificent Seven was basically the Seven Samurai just remade, right? I see. Um, and so. Uh, yeah like just just another example of white people stealing yeah a culture oh but the reason i brought that up so mandalorian is very much in that vein of like western bounty hunter kind of stuff yeah i saw saw parts of it it looks good yeah it was good i mean all the episodes were pretty predictable like i and i'm not one of those people who's like it's predictable like I, i like being surprised i often am but i each one of these episodes like felt fairly formulaic like something i had seen before but just looking different this time you know because of the star wars setting yeah um so that was a fun experience but taika did like a he played one of the droids in in that show oh uh, in like the last episode or two so it's you know it's kind of cool to see him in that too but yeah so it might have been a star wars thing that he's doing I, that's probably that what it is, yeah. I don't think anybody does any Star Trek stuff, but I don't think those have really been successful, to be honest. Did you did you see the last one they did? I don't think so. I was never, that's one thing I was never into Star Trek. Me neither, man. I like those yeah. movies, especially the last one, because the last one didn't feel like hampered by a bunch of continuity that I needed to know about. It was just like a fun adventure. Yeah. But the reason I didn't, yeah. Your boy Face Record said I couldn't do the new Star Wars. I tried multiple times and couldn't do it. I haven't even seen the last one. Yeah. Like I watched the new first two and I was just like pretty nonplussed. And I love Ryan uh Johnson who did the the second to last one. Um but uh yeah, the last Star Trek was dope. And what was crazy, it there was it was nominated for an Oscar for um like visual uh, like makeup and stuff but it lost to the suicide squad huh, which that was garbage had cool stuff but i was like man this star trek movie took idris elba and made him look like a freakish alien like give them an oscar like he's the <laughs> handsomest man in the world like he, yeah. he just like you know yeah um yeah that's funny God, I, my my brain is just not working well right now. I'm just thinking of like movie stuff, and I just can't even. Right. I just can't even process it. Um. Yeah, man. Uh, 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 are you so? Are you excited for the new Black Widow movie? Yeah, I mean, I I think I would be more excited, but I. <laughs> This is going to sound silly. One of my biggest pet peeves is like fake Russian accents. Mm. Like I can't stand them. It's one of the, that and like, you know, Latin, like the Spanish accents are the two and Arabic ones too are like, those are the most like egregiously sounding, like fake sounding accents to me. Um, And so just seeing like, actors that i know are american be like oh i'm from russia it's like shut up stop it yeah so it has me like not excited <laughs> which is funny because i've known i've known a lot of russians in my life and none of them have accents like that yeah well because the, there's a distinction where 
when someone has an accent, they're trying to like speak. Like if someone's speaking English and they're from elsewhere, right? Yeah. There's a difference between somebody trying to speak English with their native accent and somebody trying to affect a different accent while speaking English. You know what I mean? I see. Yeah, yeah. There's like an extra layer of disconnect there that that makes it sound really false and like disingenuous. Yeah. What is he saying here? Have you guys seen the movie called The Congress? No. The Congress it has the one from Splash. Is that Daryl Hannah? That's I don't old. Think I've seen that. I was thinking of uh, my wife wanted to s- watch this movie. And you're talking about different New Zealand movies, um, and it's about it's about like these it's about these troll like these people that are trolls. Um, Maybe the Hobbit. <laughs> no, it's I gotta see. It was it was the craziest movie. She always she's a really huge like movie buff and so she picks these re- she always finds these really cool movies no this movie um, the congress looks crazy oh it's robin wright robin wright so daryl hannah was in splash this is um the woman from the princess bride and this looks tight yeah let's check this out oh we have to look it up we just watched princess bride the other night actually my wife had never saw it never seen it I don't think I've ever seen it either. My wife loves it. We have it, and she bought it because we're like, "Oh, we're gonna watch that movie," and I haven't. Okay. Just haven't done it yet. So this movie's called, it's called Border. Border. And. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We we saw a trailer for that because we were like, "What is this?" Because it was yeah. like listed under fantasy. Yeah. Yeah. Was it good? Uh, dude. <laughs> It was amazing. I mean, it was amazing in like a crazy way. You know, it was, it was kind of an art film, and it's about it's so it's about like it's it's an art film, and it's about uh, I don't want to give the movie away, but it's it's about people that it's about this guy that or girl I can't remember. I think it starts with maybe a a, a female, and she, She's yeah, like a it's a female. Agent, right? Yeah, that's right. And I saw it a while ago. And she, she like is just, uh, you know, she has a special talent. Like she can smell, sniff out things. Mm-hmm. And anyway, it just develops, and she was, you know, and so it develops into like she's kind, she's a different. Uh, she's not a human. And so. And then she meets the guy who has like the same kind of. Well, I don't want to give the movie away, but you know, okay. it's. It, it's a great. I I'll mean, check it out. It's on our list for sure because we were like, we got to see that. Yeah. Um, it's really cool. Uh, I mean, it's it's kind of in the. It's not. Records. It's not like a superhero oh, movie. Sorry, yeah. I was gonna say it's not a superhero movie, but it's kind of you know it's in there the magical thing, like kind of supernatural. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of. Right? It's, it's yeah. really weird. It's really. But I'm there's down a, for that. There's a really weird sex scene in it, and like with <laughs> yeah, with, some troll sex with babies yeah, and bro. stuff. Uh, seriously, it's like it's like almost alien. It, it like it's weird. It's pretty yeah. weird. Um, what is he saying? Uh, Face Records is asking if we've seen Zero Theorem. I haven't seen that. That's a Terry Gilliam or Gilliam movie. Zero I don't theorem. know how to say his last name. Um, his stuff is trippy. My wife loves it. Uh, She's wanted to see that. I'm like, ah, you can watch that one without me. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> He said I used to jerk off to those parts in the, the Alien series. Oh yeah, the species. I was I was about to say you mean species because I remember seeing those and being like. Speaking Whoa. of being a teen and like amazed by movies, uh, I have to say the movie Buffy the Vamp the Vampire Slayer. You remember the the I old one? It. I remember it, but yeah. Dude, classic. I mean, it doesn't has terrible ratings online for some reason, but is straight up yeah. classic. And that girl in that movie, I don't remember. I was it was in love with her when I was a kid. Um, yeah. But uh, because I, I I I'm thinking of that because I I got into uh, I started researching Paul Rubens, the guy who played Pee Wee Herman. Mm-hmm. And he he did improv, and he was friends with Phil Hartman, and he Phil Hartman helped him develop the Pee Wee Herman character. Um, no way. But it's super interesting because Paul Rubin, Rubens maybe is his name with an S, uh, yeah. 
he's in the he's in the he plays these different characters in movies and he he's in the Buffy the Vampire Slayer. He's so funny, man. He's like really funny guy. He's great. Yeah. Um but uh, I, I was trying to think of something else I saw him in. That movie was um, a little bit, you know, corny in, in its own way. It was meant to be kind of campy, I think, but um I really like the portrayal. I have to of, watch that one these days. The portrayal of I, vampires. That was, that's always been on my list. It's um, you, it's a classic, man. It's up there with like um, Back to the Future or uh, you know any of those kind of classic films from the late eighties, early nineties. Yeah, I in my um, opinion. Another really good one that Face Records was talking about how twenty fourteen was a, an underrated year for movies. Did you see? This is one of my probably top 10 on any given day uh edge of tomorrow with tom cruise and emily blunt yeah that movie is uh, fire wait, it's one of those edge like of time loop movies like groundhog day you know yeah and yeah. no, i've never seen uh, I, I, I think i wanted to watch that or something it's really good but basically the premise is like um he's a he's like a pr guy for the army and the world is at war with these aliens called mimics yeah and uh he ends up getting like thrown into battle and he's like no no no, no. you don't understand like i'm the pr guy like i i can't do battle and they're like well you're going to and he's killed and then he wakes up in the same place he started that day out in, and you know i won't get into why because it's you know part of the reveal of the movie but i see basically he's in a time loop and like keeps dying over and over again oh um as they try to fight these aliens. It's really, really good. Huh. Um, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. My my time travel story that I'm working on has an element of like a repeating day thing in it. So I actually watched that recently as kind of like some inspiration. But yeah. Uh, what was that space travel film with um Interstellar? Interstellar, yeah. Yeah. I thought that that film in my opinion that film was like the most interesting sort of like time travel weird alternate universe thing i've ever seen it was really good i saw it in the theater and i don't that's not the type of movie that i should see in a theater um because like it's really like long and drawn out and a lot of it takes place on a spaceship and i hate that's why i never got into star trek is because I felt like every time I was flipping the channel, it would just be them sitting on a ship, and I was just like, "This looks fucking boring." <laughs> like, yeah, well, especially do something, the way know? that they did it with like not a lot of music, and like tried to portray yeah. space. I love, I loved that. I thought it was the most amazing way to portray space. But yeah, how it's just like a you're talking about Interstellar, right? How yeah, it's yeah, just kind of like a silent void a lot of the time. Yeah, it was crazy. Yeah. It was like I don't know. I felt like it was I was really experiencing space watching that movie. Like, oh my god scary yeah we we were just talking about jim jarmusch what what is his newest vampire movie i don't know if i'm familiar with that oh no i never saw um, double what i wanted i was thought about seeing that only lovers left alive i had my wife saw that i haven't seen that that's when you know we've been doing a vampire movie kick recently we just watched all the underworld movies <laughs> and uh that and then we did blade and i'm that stoked one for blade notes. too because that's my favorite but only lovers um, left alive. Yeah, man, that Blade film, uh, that that film has a lot to live up to. I mean, the actor's awesome. So, yeah, you know. But I mean, Blade is kind of a perfect movie in a lot of ways. I don't know. Yeah. You know, it'll be interesting to see them tie it into the Marvel universe. You know. Yeah. Well, did you see that they're bringing back? Uh, they potentially bringing back uh, the Green Lantern with Ryan Reynolds for DC. I just heard that tonight. Yeah, they're doing all this like stunt stuff where they're <laughs> like, "Oh, Michael Keaton's coming back as Batman in this alternate future, you know, Flash thing and stuff." Oh yeah, yeah, they're doing uh, a new a new Blade. Face Records is asking if they're doing a new Blade yeah. with no. Yeah, they're doing Marshall a... Ali is playing Blade though, which I mean, that's as good as yeah. casting gets if you're not have I mean, honestly, they yeah. should just bring Wesley Snipes back. Yeah. Well, it's kind of hard because Blade doesn't age, so you can't. Yeah. You'd have but to, I mean, Snipes looks pretty good for his, you know. Well, they'd have to figure. I think it would be cool if they did some kind of like. Uh, oh no! Logan. Blade does age. Blade ages just like a normal person. That oh, was, does he? That was actually okay. a, yeah a line in the first movie because I, I just watched it the other day. It would be cool if they did some sort of old man Logan type 
thing with with Blade yeah, with Wesley yes. Snipes. I I think uh, when yep. they when they ca- announced the casting, my boy Dennis goes, "Summer Herschel is always trying to ice skate uphill." <laughs> <laughs> that guy's an amazing actor, though. I mean, yeah, he uh, what he was in uh, Moonlight. Is that right? Moonlight, yeah. Um, yeah. He won an Oscar for that, and then won an Oscar, I think, the next year for Green Book, which I haven't seen. Yeah, there's that movie um, has a lot of controversy. But every every film that I've yeah. seen that guy in, everything I've seen him in, he just blows me away. I can even like an. Did stupid, you see? I was, I was True Detective it. season three. Oh yeah, dude. Oh, uh, it's yeah. incredible in that. That whole show is crazy, but yeah, that was, he's just a, he's an amazing. Even just an interview, like I watched an interview with him. A while back and it was like dang this guy is just awesome like he's he was in that show rami that i've been watching that's like about an egyptian dude um because mm. mm-hmm. he's muslim that that actor uh, mahershala ali so he played like this what's it called a sheikh which is kind of like a like a spiritual leader in the mosques yeah um so he's kind of like mentoring the main character of the show so that was cool to see him on that because yeah you know this man's winning oscars he can do whatever he wants but he you know like did this hulu show yeah i just um, i just saw episode. the preview for that and i was like oh i gotta watch that that looks good it's really good man and honestly dude it's it's kind of changed my life in some ways um you know i mean you know they say representation is so important and i agree you know but yeah and and as like a straight cis american man like a lot of shit is for me you know what I mean? Like I'm not sure. underrepresented sure. in a lot of ways. Sure. But I've never seen anything that like really reflected me as like, you know, an Egyptian. Like, especially being raised in, you know, this country. Like uh I thought so many things that had happened to me were just like a unique singular mm. experience. Right. Yeah. And to to see that stuff like put on screen in a way that's like so authentic and also funny just like i mean it was it was like transcendent for me like i was just like oh my god I'm, you know yeah um and i honestly man it gave me closure on a lot of stuff that i you know was holding on to from when i was a kid that happened or that i was that was said to me or that i was taught you know that that had lasting implications like Mm. even just little shit from growing up that i never knew why that happened or why i was told that Mm. and to see that it's just kind of commonplace that's just how egyptian parents are or something you know it's just like damn like it hit me pretty hard that's i had my wife watch it like to be like this is what this is what i'm talking about that's why i do these things you know (laughs) yeah well you can you if i'm from our last talk you grew up pretty isolated from you know it was like only kind of only you basically with your father so you didn't have a lot of peers around to connect yeah. with right yeah 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 and you know i have three sisters and like i saw how i was treated differently than them you know yeah and, uh that that's a you know the main character on the show has a sister and that's a big part of of the show too is like how they treat him versus her and you yeah. know and that th- i mean that has lasting impacts into like relationships of mine you know because uh i've sure. i mean one of the reasons i started going to therapy you know all those years ago is that i guess it's been like four or five now um no i actually almost six but anyway um you know i came from a household that was like very patriarchal and my wife did as well and i did not want us to slip into those roles where i just become like the you know i'm wearing the pants and she just follows the whims of my moods and shit because that's how my dad was yeah and that's how her dad was oh so i you know i need i realized that if i wasn't careful i would probably fall into just what i saw growing up and so would she and so i needed the tools to to you know break that cycle basically Mm -hmm. yeah it's interesting it's just it's good to hear that though you know i think 
cult- culturally and generationally, you know, I think things need to change just to see, like, okay, well, these parts of the culture are valuable, but, like, these parts could be altered to not damage, you know, relationships and so, yeah. you know, I'm just seeing. Yeah, that. and, you know, there are also, like, sort of traditional binary gender roles that we slip into, you know, and oh, it's yeah. just kind of like we don't know we're even doing it, you know, like, um, so yeah, I don't know. It's just interesting to try to like learn where those lines are and be conscious of that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty, it's pretty interesting. My wife is really big into that and, and, and teaching me about feminism and, and, you know, I'm only realizing recently, you know, my father's dad was, um, he was in the military and, uh, what was that? Oh, we got three viewers. My, he was in the military, and so there's a lot of that that's, you know, passed. I never really thought about it, but I'm kind of from a military family in that way. Um, my cousins mm. are all in the military, but my dad wasn't in the military, but um, he kind of carried on some of that sternness and that level of respect type type of thing, and it's, you know, it's just interesting how stuff like that is passed down. It's like to really look at it and say is this valuable in my life is this yeah you know yeah and also like shit you heard when you were a kid that stuck with you like i've told you this before but but when i was like six years old i remember telling my dad that i was full at dinner and he looked at me and he was like brahim every grain of rice wasted will speak against you on the day of judgment in front of allah respect the food ibrahim clear your plate there are kids in other countries don't have this food huh you you know and i was just like and I remember, like, you know, I was an imaginative kid and, like, thinking, like, picturing this, like, grain of rice. Like, like oh, you remember the cone heads on SNL? Like, that's kind of yeah. what it looked like in my head, except it didn't have a face. <laughs> it yeah. was, like, in a suit, and I was in an interrogation room, like, like I'd seen on TV, and it was, like, pointing at me, like, it was him, you know? And I just was like, shit. So I clear my plate at every meal. And, like, yeah. you know, good lesson to learn, but, like, the extreme level at which like a lot of that shit was conveyed to me as a kid like has stuck with me and sure. to the point where i mean dude when when we worked in a restaurant together remember how much food we had to throw away every day yeah i mean probably 10 pounds a piece on any like busy night yeah you know? well and what blows me away yeah. is like that's just one restaurant think of all the restaurants all the banquets and restaurants i mean it's oh right it's amazing especially when we were downtown and there's all these like houseless folks down there and stuff without, you know, and we're just like sh- scraping shit off <laughs> fucking, you sure. know, big green bin and stuff. Sure. And uh, yeah, man. So that was like a really uh, like difficult thing for me at first being there and getting used to that. Cause there was a big part of me, honestly, that wanted to be like, well, they didn't really t- touch this part of me. What if I just eat it? You know, like, and it wasn't even cause I was necessarily hungry. It was just, like, I didn't want it to go to waste cause it was so, burned into my brain that like i was gonna go to hell for that you know mm-hmm. even though as a like a grown adult not believing in heaven and hell necessarily like mm-hmm. it was still you know weighed on me in that way well i think um, ab- i think about you know like one time i i uh my dog wasn't eating and i sort of made the joke out loud with my wife in the room of like if you don't uh you know if if you don't eat your food starving dogs in other countries are going to you know would kill <laughs> yeah. would kill for that or whatever you know that the the, ter- the similar kind of term in a way and it's like you know i think about like being a kid and someone telling you that it's just like a terrible it's a terrible way to right. you know shame somebody into finishing their food and you know it's all yeah uh, and that was something i got from that show was like seeing that like that's maybe just a, a middle eastern parent thing to do mm-hmm. like is some like some of the extreme shit they were saying like um well i have like to the s- dad tells the sister when she's young the whole thing about how like if she gets pregnant before she's married nobody will want her and the blah 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 and the stuff with the devil and yeah. then he like takes a swig of a drink and then is like also you're buying we're buying too many pokemon cards for you <laughs> and it was just like it's like when you're this little kid, you're being told these heavy things, and then it's also like, oh, by the way, go watch Ninja Turtles. Or whatever, yeah, you know. Yeah, I uh, so when I was um, uh, so I was selling, I was helping businesses and setting up POS systems and credit card stuff 
for a few year for a couple of years and I worked with this guy that he owned a uh, a market on division uh, and he was I would just cold call businesses I would walk in and meet people and um he was from Iraq he owned this store and he didn't speak English hardly at all um and he was he was struggling with just l- he, he so basically he was he was in the army he worked he was in the he joined the American army in Iraq and got into this s- sort of they have this system where can he can uh, basically become an American citizen if he ser- yeah. served or whatever is what he told me anyways uh, long story short I got to know him and I worked with him I set up his store I met a bunch of his friends from you know different countries Afghanistan and guys that own gas stations and own all these businesses and and i was like the only american that they knew you know they just they were all fresh from their countries and um and i had never really you know i had known people from middle eastern countries and things but i had never been around families and and different all different people different types of people and so he's talking to me a lot about you know everything we did was like so serious and you know, it all had to do with, um, you know, God and, you know, uh, you know, any any type of, d- I was helping him, like, pay his bills and stuff and going to the bank with it. It wasn't my job, but I was just helping him because he couldn't communicate well. Um, yeah. And it was just astounding, like, the way he would talk to his family and just, like, s- everything was so serious. He had, yeah. such, he had such a serious life, you know, he'd been, he'd hit a, a blown up from a mine and he had shrapnel that, he wow. had removed and uh, he, everything he told me was just crazy serious and he had so much PTSD probably it was just Man. Th- you know it was just amazing i there i had a found newfound respect for the seriousness of of their culture and you know, all those it guys. is man i mean er, because like uh you know before you make your five prayers a day there's like a a, a cleansing ritual that you do where you like wash your hands three times, your face three times, like your ears, your nose, like your feet, your hair. And like, uh, you know, you do this anywhere from like, you know, three to five times a day, depending on, you know, what you do in between. Like if you eat something or like break wind or go to the bathroom, you have to do it again. But if you don't do anything like that between the washings, then you don't have to do it again. Kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. So, you know, uh, in the in the very first episode of that show like uh the guy's in a hurry so he's like just doing like a sloppy quick lazy version of it and there's a there's an older guy in the mosque who sees him and he's like no and he like sits him down and he pulls his sock off and he's like you have to wash between your toes like he's telling him in arabic like he's like you have to go to god clean and if you don't go to him clean the devil can get in the devil is between your toes rami like <laughs> and like that's the kind of shit you just get told or like yeah it's okay um, it's almost like borderline like it makes uh, it's a little bit crazy thinking especially for little kids yeah it's like, yeah and it makes you like i mean dude i was always washing my hands as a kid like yeah. it, it turned me into a little ocd hand washer you know that's wild uh, yeah and i mean i lived a lot of my life like that and then eventually i just kind of got older and you know learned through sort of logic and practicality like Eh, it doesn't really you don't have to do that all that much you know sure, sure. <laughs> but yeah it's interesting what what kind of uh things different cultures prioritize in that way and like the way that they implement them if it's through like fear of you know hellfire or whatever then, yeah you know so yeah interesting 11 o'clock yeah, that was my give give the dog her pill timer going oh. off there. <laughs> yeah, man, we went double time this this week, which is nice. Yeah, it's good, man. Can't yeah. really make any music. But on a quick note, speaking of what we were speaking about, have you seen that show Master of None? Yes. Oh, uh, amazing. So, show. yeah, you'll like Rami. It's very similar to Master of None. Oh, like, okay. They feel like a companion piece to one another. Yeah, I loved that show. I was mad. I was mad about the whole stuff that was happening with Aziz Ansari, not for the fact that like, you know, what happened was wrong or right, but just for the fact that there was not going to be another season of Master of None. I was like, <laughs> no. 
Why? Why? Yeah, I heard that he addressed some of that stuff in his like most recent. He like, did he on Netflix and had a special, and I think he did a pretty good job of it. And I saw some pr- articles kind of trashing him, but I think he did a, a pretty good job. And his whole situation is it's nothing. I don't think it's anything I want to go into detail about, just because it's you know murky. But right. But uh, you know, it was just a we- it was a weird one for sure. Yeah, it definitely wasn't. A lot of these things are pretty, and and we're dealing with a lot of this stuff coming out in the comics community right now, which has been a really heavy week. I heard about that. It's definitely, yeah. yeah, I mean, some some instances are very cut and dry, and then you know, his sounded more like it was maybe a high, not a high. I don't say hindsight thing. You know, like I said, it's murky. I don't want to get into it. You know, obviously, believe women, and like if you know someone's saying like, "Hey, this happened to me," that was her experience is valid. You know. Yeah. Um, but uh yeah <laughs> do face records did you you're saying you watched rami or um master of none he said it was greta <laughs> it was a, a typo and then he just turned it into a yeah. question yeah greta I, or I, uh, thunberg yeah oh the netflix special okay yeah i gotta check that out I, I'm, I'm yeah the netflix special um, the the aziz i'm sorry one Oh yeah, yeah. Master or um, Rami's on Hulu, and so I didn't watch it for a long time because we didn't have Hulu, and then uh, we ended up getting it with mm-hmm. the quarantine stuff going on. So I was able to watch it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's great, great show. It's, great. it's Greta. It's Greta. It's a Greta show. Greta show. Yeah. <laughs> um, 